Hello, good day, everyone. Happy to have you here. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to host you, and I want to thank uh, Hilton Fox and Amano Partners in hosting this webinar. I'm glad to see such a nice uh, turnout uh, of the crowd. And I want to introduce John Medvedev, CEO, to open the webinar. We're going to listen um, to uh, a short, uh, a short overview by John, to be followed by a uh, conversation about innovation by led by Dan Fisher, and then we will have. Uh, a panel, a uh, very interesting panel conversation, uh, all together about one hour. So stay tuned and welcome everyone. Um, I'm good. John, you're good. John, you're on. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, Ohio gozaimasu to everybody in Japan. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I'm speaking to you here from Jerusalem. I want to give you a quick update on the uh, on the crowd and how we're doing. Israel has just in the last couple of weeks become, in addition to being the startup nation, the vaccine nation. Uh, it turns out that Israel has been extraordinarily aggressive in terms of vaccinating its population. As you can see by this uh, slide of data from yesterday, Israel is now by far the most active vaccinating country in the world. Actually over 30% of our total population has been vaccinated in terms of people at risk. It's already over 70 or 80% and we're on the way to complete vaccination by the end of March, which is remarkable. Uh, it, it must be mentioned by the way that Israel's infection rate is one of the highest in the world. It's been back and forth uh, near the highest. And so therefore, this vaccination campaign is extremely important for us. Uh, you might also note that our two partners in the Abraham Accords, uh, the UAE and Bahrain, are number two and number three. Uh, Israel, as you know, is the startup nation. According to the World Economic Forum, uh, we lead the world in terms of growth of innovative companies, venture capital, uh, uh, companies embracing disruptive ideas, entrepreneurial culture, and a variety of other key elements. This is reflected in a remarkable amount of money which is being invested in Israeli companies. Last year, over $10 billion. The final numbers are not in yet, but that is up over 25% year to year. And this happened in a year of corona, meaning that even though 90% of these dollars comes from overseas, people were willing to invest over Zoom, do business the way that we're doing it today, and those numbers continue to go up. Uh, our exits were remarkable. It was a great year. Last year, again, data not fully in, but uh, Israeli exits have gone from being a couple of hundred million dollars, uh, which no longer excites anybody, to being billions of dollars, led, of course, by the great Mobileye transaction of 2017 for $16 billion to Intel. The, te the tech ecosystem here is really a well-oiled machine with the entrepreneurs at the heart, but lots of angel investors, VC funds, very important role of the multinationals, the tech units from the IDF incubators, and uh, of course, venture capital funds. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have this new agreement now with our new partners in the uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. This is historic. It's really like dropping the uh, old iron curtain. This time we dropped the sand curtain and it is bringing enormous opportunity between Israel and its neighbors and it's attracting interest all around the world, including in Japan because of the economic opportunity as a result of these new uh, uh, developments politically. We have moved aggressively by hiring a head of operations in the Gulf, and you'll be hearing a lot from us over the next several months and years about our activities over there. Uh, our crowd today is a quite uh, effective and large operation operating all over the world. We're close now actually to almost 70,000 investors. These slides have to be updated all the time. And we've invested about, uh, in 220 companies and 23 funds. We have a billion and a half of commitments under management. We're Israel's most active uh, venture capital investor. And we do it both in individual companies and in funds. We have institutions and individual investors all together in the same platform. Our portfolio is by 
design a very uh, diversified portfolio, active in healthcare, enterprise solutions, ag tech, fintech, cybersecurity, and every area of technology. Uh, we make uh, approximately about 40 plus new investments every year, and we follow about 60 uh, others of our already existing portfolio. Uh, our investor base, as I said today, is approaching the 70,000. We ended uh, uh, last year with about 65. You can see that our pace of growth is actually accelerating. Uh, this month, we're having the fastest growth we've ever seen in history of our crowd, and that we hope will continue. We allow you to either build your funds or to select your own. And what's really exciting about what's going on in Israel is the AI or artificial intelligence component. We're really in the top three countries in the world in terms of AI startups. And if you wanna look at it, uh, it's quite remarkable how many companies are active in that AI environment. And it really powers everything whether it's IoT or the cloud, 5G, or the next uh, generation of, uh, of chips. Turns out that this last year has been a great year for fundraising for many of our companies, as well as leadership in fighting the pandemic and technologies associated with that. Many of our companies now have grown to be worth more than $100 million, uh, 60 plus, and that will continue. And we've had 46 exits uh, led by both IPOs and by major or corporations buying our companies. Turns out that we had the best IPO of 2019 in New York, which was called Beyond Meat, and the best IPO of 2020 it was called Lemonade. Let's hope we can get another one this year. When you look at our portfolio, you'll see that we're active in many areas. And in fact, uh, on Fast Company's 50 most innovative lists, We've actually had 20 of our companies represented in the last five years. We're active in fintech, companies like Lemonade in the insurance area, BioCatch and fraud. We're active in cybersecurity, companies like CyberX for IoT or ThetaRay for today doing correspondent banking. We're active in mobility, companies like Innoviz who are leading in LiDAR or SkyTran, the next generation of urban mobility. We're active in healthcare with AlphaTau doing really remarkable anti-cancer technology or Zebra using AI to understand better radiological images. In ag tech, companies like Tevel who are using robotics to pick fruit or Tyrannus to do uh, aerial surveillance. In energy, companies like Empress powering the next generation grid or Locust View allowing uh, uh, infrastructure to be much more intelligent. And uh, of course, in AI, companies like Halo, who've just opened an operation in Japan uh, and are uh, producing perhaps the most exciting AI chip, and Memed, who are using AI to protect us from mistakes in prescriptions. I want to just end with uh, a couple of comments about our activity in Japan. I'm sorry I don't have time to cover all these slides. But what I'd like to talk about is the fact that we have just recently concluded a deal uh, with uh, uh, a, a very important uh, Japanese uh, corporation called Oryx, who have announced a $60 million investment in the parent of our crowd. We're very excited about this Oryx cooperation. Uh, this is a, simply the latest reflection of our commitment to the Japanese market We've had engagements, as you'll hear about later in this seminar, with companies such as Denso and Honda, Toyota Susho and Hitachi. Uh, we've had co-investments into our companies from companies like uh, Kubota and Toyota and many, many others. We have with us today uh, friends from ATI, Akimoto-san and others. You'll be hearing about our commitment to Japan, but Japan is going to become a much more important market for our crowd in the light of this Oryx investment. And with this, I'm going to turn it back to Dan Fischel to continue this discussion. And we look forward soon to beating this pandemic and to seeing you face to face here in Israel for our annual summit and soon in Japan. Thank you very, very much. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, 
And we, as John said, we're going to turn to Dan Fischer, VP Business Development, who's going to uh, lead us through uh, innovation in times of crisis and pandemic. And Dan, over to you. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, I'm going to start with a bold statement. We are in a Darwinian moment in corporate history. In the next five to seven years, we're going to see a redistribution of corporate winners and corporate losers. The winners are those corporations that will have adjusted faster to an underlying technological change that is sweeping uh, humanity right now. The losers will be those corporations that were slow to react to change even before COVID. Now, McKinsey has recently found out that corporations that invest in innovation at times of crisis, they outperform competition during recovery. This is data from 2008. You can see corporations that invested in innovation, they outperform the S&P 500 index by up to 30%. Now, why is this so important? It is important because the lifespan of S&P 500 companies is decreasing exponentially from 60 years to less than 20 now to just about 12 in, in uh, five to six years. Now, why is this happening? Credit Suisse has found out that the main reason for the decreasing lifespan of, of uh, corporations is technology disruption. Now, technology disruption basically means that a product or a service is introduced to market and renders, makes all previous products obsolete. Think about the iPhone that disrupted all previous phones. Now, technology disruption is nothing new. It's been with us since the Industrial Revolution, right? The, the, the car disrupted the, the horse. What's new is the pace, the speed in which it happens. If you take a look at this chart, it shows the technology adoption of Americans over the past century. You can see that it took Americans 50 years to adopt electricity in their homes. It took them less than 10 to adopt the smartphone. Now, all this was before COVID. What we're witnessing in COVID, and this is yesterday's slide, we all know this, is an exponential acceleration in tech adoption. If it's Amazon that's you know, hiring 100,000 employees and, and Facebook and, and Microsoft, the charts are, you know, technology adoption is, is, is up the charts. But what does it actually mean? Okay, if we take a deeper look at what is this news that we all know, we all feel this kind of tech acceleration, what does it actually mean? You can see that Zoom, for example, this software that we're using now, uh, in 2019, before COVID, it replaced business meetings. But now, it's replacing business travel, right? Netflix in 2019 replaced the television. Now it's replacing going to the movie theater and so on and so forth. So my point is that unlike any other kind of uh, uh, increase in tech adoption, what the pandemic has caused is several things. It first, it caused to, you know, a dramatic shift in consumer behaviors, in human behaviors. Something remarkable that never happened before. It's reaching new demographics like the elderly. Never before happened. Now, my, my parents are using the internet to buy groceries, et cetera, et cetera. And for corporation, it, for corporation, it helps fuel a transition to the cloud because the, the on-premise IT infrastructure are not designed for uh, work from home. Now, if we're trying to put a number on how much, how much, it has been accelerated over the past years, uh, or will accelerate, of course. Uh, the CEO of Microsoft back in April said, we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in, in just two months, but that was in April. Now McKinsey has found out that the digitization of customer interactions has accelerated globally by three years. It means that 58% of customer interactions globally is now digital up for 30 up from 36 percent this is a huge increase but here's the really interesting data offerings that are digital in nature either in whole or in part have accelerated globally by seven years in asia by the way it's 10 years so what happens when covid eventually is going to disappear from our lives with the vaccinations of everything are we going back no way 
Not a single time in human history we've seen the, tech, the, the, the technology adoption reverses. And if we, are, we were to put uh, qualitatively what's happening right now on, on this chart, it would be a straight line up, the digitization of everything that hasn't been digital. Now, we all know, we all hear about tech adoption. We all feel uh, the, the implication of tech adoption in our lives. But what about automation? And automation is gonna be dramatically changed by, uh, by COVID as well. And by automation, I mean the process by which humans are replaced by machines. Now, uh, we tend to intuitively think about automation as a linear process. Every year, more humans are replaced by more machines. But this assumption that automation is a linear process is, is wrong. Automation is happening in bursts, in, in spikes, okay? And they are centered around economic crisis. For example, in 2008, in 2000 and 1991, we've seen a spike of automation. And this is happening because when uh, the relative cost of labor goes up, because companies' revenue go down, the large corporations they simply lay off employees. And, and which type of employees are laid off in previous recessions, but also in this one? Unsurprisingly, these are the, uh, the, the lower income occupations, the, the, the type of routine uh, occupations that can be easily automated. And the people who lost their jobs in previous recessions, but also in this one, are replaced with a mix of technology and highly skilled employees. We can see that uh, in the 2008 recession, there's been in the years following that recession, a spike in the demand for employees that have better experience, be better education, and most importantly, better computer skills. Now, here is the data that is really mind blowing. The automation potential of the US job market, and it's true for many developed economies, is double digit. In the US, it's 46%. 46% of jobs in the US can be automated. It doesn't mean that they will be automated, but they can be automated. And if we're looking at the industry that is most susceptible, most prone for uh, disruption by automation, it's the accommodation and food services. And you know what? This is exactly, this is exactly the sector, you know, that is, uh, damaged most by, by the pandemic, hotel workers, restaurant workers. Now, the one thing that is dramatically different in this recession as compared to others is that for the first time, humanity has a technology that can replace humans, not just in manual labor, like in factories, but also in cognitive skills, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. They can replace humans in tasks like, uh, you know, insurance agents. They can replace insur insurance agents with bots like Lemonade. Uh, it can replace, uh, you know, even actual human, human interaction as we're gonna see with intuition robotics. The AI, the impact of AI on our economy and as a result on the lifespan of corporation is gonna be dramatic in the next five to seven years. Now, when we're looking at uh, what's happening right now, we can see two different trends. First is an acceleration of technologies. The other one is the transformation of technologies. By the acceleration, I mean the increase in the adoption rate of existing technology for a given sector. Think about financial services. What they need is to digitize. Now, the dig digitization technology is already out there. It's on the shelf. Everything they need is just to take it and adopt it. But on the other hand, we have transformation. It's the application of new technology or the, the repurposing of existing technology into a new sector. Think about airports, think about air travel. They need to transition from regular airport security into biosecurity. So this is, a, again, a very qualitative way to look into what's happening right now in terms of uh, the shift between transformation versus acceleration. And we wanna keep this uh, session interactive. So we have a very quick poll question for you. Um, how is your sector affected? Is it going to go an acceleration of existing technology like financial services? 
Will it go and uh, transformation into new technologies or repurposing of existing technologies? Maybe it's a combination of the two, or maybe your sector is not affected at all. So let's wait another five seconds and let's see the results. Okay, so the vast majority of you are saying that you know, your sector would undergo a combination of both acceleration of existing technology and transformation. Very, very interesting. Okay, so in order to succeed, I think it's pretty clear uh, in the days post COVID, we need to innovate. And there's two types of innovation. There is incremental innovation, which is the shift from a, a three blade razor into a five blade razor. And there is disruptive innovation what Netflix did to the DVD, what Spotify did to the CD, what the iPhone did to all previous phones. Now let's take another quick poll break and please answer this only if you are working in a corporation. Who is your main comp competitor? Again, only if you're working in a corporation and I know there, I've seen the list, there are many, many of you. Uh, who is your main competitor? Is it another large corporation? Are they small uh, and medium sized businesses? Maybe there are startups, or maybe none of the above. So let's give it another five seconds. Think about one, one competitor is enough, uh, the main one. So who is your main competitor? And let's see the results. OK, so most of you, most corporate executives, they, you, you think that the, uh, um, the, the, your main competitor is another large corporation. Um, now, if you're saying that your main competitor is, is a large corporation, it means that you're thinking in terms of incremental innovation. My large competitor is another large corporation. If you said that your main competitors are startups, it means that you're thinking in terms of disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation. Because disruptive innovation almost never comes from, from a large corporation. A large corporation never come, rarely ever, okay? Almost never uh, comes with a, a new product or technology or, or service that makes another corporation uh, obsolete. It almost never happens. What does happen is that disruptive innovation is coming from startups because, um, you know, these startups are very, very small. And as a group, they go after every single line of business of a corporation. And because they're small, they specialize in one thing and that one thing they do really, really well. And as a group, they present a big threat to corporations. Now here's something just to show you how disruptive technology has changed our economy in just 10 years, okay? 10 years ago uh, in Q4 2010, there were only two tech companies in the list of top 10 largest companies in the world by market cap. Fast forward 10 years, so that's the data of the 31st of December 2020. Nine out of the world's biggest companies are tech companies, nine. Now, let's take a closer look at who, who these nine companies are, and you can find out that they are on average 28 years old. They've been startups only yesterday. And while number 10 in the list, Warren Buffett from Berkshire Hathaway is, you know, he's been selling all of, your, all of his stock in airlines, taking a huge loss, the big tech companies or tech companies in general have never done better. They were beating, you know, analyst expectations one quarter after the other. And as John said before, even investments in Israeli startups has been up 25% in a year of crisis. So how is it possible? How is it possible that the world economy is going south, but technology tech companies are doing so well? And the answer is that the only vaccine to COVID, the only vaccine to coronavirus is technology. And I'm not talking about the actual vaccination, the technology, the mRNA vaccination used by uh, Pfizer and, and Moderna, a lot of technology there. I'm, I'm talking about simple technology for day to day that simply keeps our economy going. And what do we need to keep our econ economy going? We need a, a solid internet connection. 
We need a solid uh, mobile data network so we can you know, take fo phone calls. We need uh, remote work software like Zoom that is cheap and available. We need software to send our, our kids to school. Can you imagine what would have happened if COVID were to strike in 2008? There was no Zoom, there was just Skype and there was no, no screen sharing to the best of my knowledge. Can you imagine what, what, what would have happened if COVID were to strike in 1991? There was not even the internet. What would have happened to humanity back then? You know, it's two, two, two ways. We would either be forced to stay at home and, and starve. So probably not an option. Most likely we would have just continued as, as you know, working as, they, you know, as keep the economy as uh, business as usual and, and simply pay a much higher toll in human lives. So if I were to just leave you with one slide from this short presentation, it would have been, it would be this one. Investing in innovation at times of crisis guarantees that you will outperform competition during recovery. And the time to invest in innovation is right now. It's not yesterday. It's definitely not tomorrow. It's right now. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, great presentation, and I'm happy to uh, to move to the to the next part of this uh, webinar, which is our uh, our interesting panel. And I'm happy to introduce you to Gilad Meirovich, a partner and head of Japan practice at Herzog Fox Neiman. It's Israel's largest law firm. He focuses on representation of Japanese companies in their business activities in Israel and Israeli startups in their strategic agreements with Japanese customers. So it's my real pleasure. Uh, to move the mic and the screen to Gilad uh, to introduce the, the distinguished panelists. Thank you. Ali, konnichiwa. It is uh, my great, great pleasure to be here and uh, moderate this panel. Before we begin, here's a summary of uh, 2020. So uh, we all experienced uh, very difficult times. There was a big concern of the Israeli high-tech industry in the beginning of the crisis that this year may be catastrophic for the local industry. However, at the end, we witnessed actually an increase in the, in the number of investments in the Israeli high-tech industry compared to 2019. But most investments came from American investors and Israeli VC funds. Then we have seen last year less M&A transactions in Israel in the high-tech sector, however, as a substitute, we're starting to see Israeli mature startups who are looking for capital in NASDAQ, in IPOs, or in Israel in IPOs, or in SPAC deals in NASDAQ, the, the short form IPO. Then with respect to Japan, Israel, Japanese investments into Israeli startups were at a peak at uh, 2019. First quarter of 2020 started strong with more investments compared to the previous period in 2019. However, there has been a decline in the number of deals as of the second quarter of 2020. So what about 2021? We will discuss in the panel how 2021 may look like with respect to the Japan-Israel corporate transactions and how we can continue the momentum of 2019. We have a fantastic panel, which I'm very happy to present. First one, Nobuyaki Akimoto, co-founder and managing director of TransLink Capital and managing partner of AT Partners. Akimoto-san, if you want to say anything before I move on, please do. Uh, thank you for your up. Uh, I think I can make a brief introduction myself. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this kind of great webinar. Uh, I am Nobuyuki Akimoto, uh, co-founder and the managing director of AT Partners. You can just call me Aki. Uh, AT Partners is VC in Japan, focusing on the investment in Israel top tier VC fans in order to be the bridge between Israeli startup community and the Japanese large corporations. So we are not typical VC, but we are a kind of open innovation enabler by using the fan of fan relationship and to help both Japanese large corporations and the Israeli startups for their collaboration. Uh, I'm really looking forward to having this kind of a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Akimoto-san. Uh, another panelist, Denise Ban, managing partner at R-Crowd. 
Okay, good morning. Konnichiwa, itsumo osavani natamasu. My name is um, Dennis Van, and I'm a serial entrepreneur turned serial investor. Uh, prior to our crowd, I founded a company called Pocket Guide, which became the world's leading travel application. And I met John Madved, our CEO, who you saw earlier, eight years ago, when our crowd was still in the garage. And today I'm a managing partner and have been managing much of our growth in Asia for the past five, six years. And it's really an honor to be here again. Thank you, Denise. And our third panelist, Dor Schooler, co-founder and CEO of the Israeli startup Intuition Robotics. Hi, everyone. Konnichiwa as well. Uh, a real pleasure to be here. To today um, <clears throat> is a special honor because I happen to share a stage with two of our investors. So our crowd was an early investor in our company. Um, and through our partnership with uh, Sompo, Akimoto-san is also an investor in, in our company. In fact, I think we're uh, probably the reason I'm here is that we are an interesting example of an Israeli startup that her, um, our seed funding was done locally but the lead of our A round was uh, Toyota Motor Corporation and the lead of our B round was also in Japan uh, with Sparks with participation with other corporates like Toyota and Sompo. So I think we're um, really happy to talk to you all. Um, as far as what we do really quickly, uh, we create this uh, robot that you can see here on the side of me called uh, LEQ and LEQ deals with the elder population helps them avoid loneliness, social isolation, and stay healthy while aging at home, which of course during the times of COVID is very, very important. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Dor. Okay, so let's begin with, uh, with our questions. So my first question is uh, to all of you in the panel. So we live in difficult historical times. We have travel restrictions, work from home, and lockdowns. In this environment, how, how can we move forward various work streams between Israeli startups and uh, Japanese corporations under such difficult conditions? Perhaps uh, Akimoto-san, would you like to begin? Uh, yeah, so I would like to share uh, three points today for mainly for Israeli startups. The first one, uh, even under this kind of the difficult circumstances, uh, Japanese corporations are still positive, I think, on the open innovation activities, including the investment. Although the total investment amount has decreased compared with the 2019 and the 2020, for example, from Q1 through Q3, 2019 was about 2 billion US dollar in total. And that of 2020 was about 1.5 billion US dollar. But when we compared with after Lehman shock, the situation is much, much better. Uh, I think we had 2.8 billion US dollar in 2006 and went down to 800 million US dollar in 2009. So you can understand that the Japan still maintains the momentum of startup investment, not like Lehman shock. Moreover, the ratio of CBC investment to total amount in 2019 was 28% and 35.5% in first half of 2020. This means corporate venture capital, I mean, large corporate investment has been relatively increasing despite this difficult situation. So many of them understand that the open innovation where the startups would be really important for the future growth of after COVID or with COVID. That's the first thing. Second thing, uh, then how we can communicate with the Japanese corporation under these difficult circumstances. Uh, due to COVID-19, uh, Japanese government has asked the corporation to adapt work from home, uh, which is really a difficult task for Japanese corporations. But According to the research conducted in last month, December 2020, 24.7% uh, have already got started work from home system. When we take a look at the large corporations only, which have more than 10,000 employees, 45% have already done it. The way I read this number for Israeli startups is pretty much positive. 
since Japanese corporations are getting used to have a business meeting online, so you may be able to meet more Japanese corporation without face-to-face -face meeting than before. Third one, this may not be the good news. Then the next question is whether or not the decision-making process has been changed according to the new working style. The answer is, uh, is that a, the working place or environment or working tool like Slack or Zoom might have been adapted. The way of this film making a process has no big change. I know that the Japanese corporations are really good at moving slowly, even under normal circumstances. The COVID-19 might have given them the reason to move more slowly. So taking these things into consideration, having the right players who can help you find out the Japanese corporations for potential collaboration and or investment has been more and more important. The players who knows the current situation in Japan or even the detailed situation of a specific Japanese corporation. I think our crowd is one of them. And uh, for example, entrepreneur who has enough experiences working with the Japanese corporation like Door as well. And uh, of course, I myself, AT Partners, uh, one of the family members of our crowd, happy to help. Uh, I can say the same thing to Japanese corporation, having the right partner to find out the prospect of Israeli startup is really, really important. Again, we can understand that this difficult circumstances may be rather the good chance for, from the perspective of the relationship between Israeli and Japan. That's it. Thank you, Okimoto-san. Dor, how do you see the situation from an Israeli startup perspective? Yeah, so um, I think what we found is that continuing the relationships that we have created before COVID, no problem to do during the, using Zoom and using other collaboration methods. Um, those relationships were created over a long and mutual investment of time um, through lots of personal visits. And they're also kind of personal, right? There needed to be an establishment of underlying trust. And sometimes you see each other eye to eye to also help overcome the cultural differences. And I find that um, Japanese corporates um, want to see that you have an inkling of an understanding of how business is done in Japan um, and who you are as a person <laughs> um, and the management style of your corporation and the ethics of your corporation as a building block to sustaining and building a long-term win-win relationship. That is very hard to establish over Zoom. Very, very hard to establish over Zoom. So uh, at kind of a summary point, we've been able to continue, grow and enhance our existing relationships. Um, we haven't even tried <laughs> to tell you the truth. We've focused our energy elsewhere on creating new relationships with partners in Japan during COVID. Thank you, Dor. And Denise, how do you see things from a VC perspective? Sure. So I think there are obvious disadvantages, I think, and Akisan and Dor highlighted them. But maybe, maybe actually, when it comes to specifically to the relationship between Japan and Israel, I think actually there could be a, a couple of advantages, how we can turn the disadvantages into advantages. Number one, I think there is no, it's, it's not a secret that anybody who has been working between the Japan and Israel relationship, that when it comes to cross-cultural gaps, I mean, Israel and Japan are at the very, very opposite uh, end of the spectrum, right? I think there, is, there was this famous map that has been presented where they looked at negotiations and how they looked at two variables, confrontational and emotionally expressive, right? And Israel and Israelis, as we all know, they are confrontational, very confrontational and very emotionally expressive. You know, you look at the Japanese, they are at the very exact other side, right? Now, that actually, I think when you do the negotiations and the discussions through Zoom, I think that gap actually shrinks, right? Because kind of the, Zoom, the Zoom kind of conforms everyone 
into a very much closer state. So I think that's advantage number one for specifically for Israel and Japan. The second thing is that when it comes to pitching, right? Everybody, when we, we Israelis, or it could be also the other, the opposite direction, but we all try to either raise money or we're trying to close a deal. And we do it through Zoom. Now, I don't, I think everybody would agree with that, that if we are the one who is pitching and the, we don't know what the other side thinks, right? We don't even know if they listen, right? It could be that they are just on, but behind it, they are SMSing or writing their emails or they totally turned off, which in a face-to-face -face meeting, it's much easier to read. In Zoom, you cannot read the other person. Now, I think when it comes to the Japanese, they are extremely patient and they are extremely polite. They are the most polite people I've ever seen in my life, right? So they will never do that. They will give you the attention that other nation, other people may be not, right? So I think that's again a huge advantage because whether you are pitching, trying to raise money or you're trying to sell your product, you will be listened to. Okay, thank you, Denise. So uh, let's move to the next question, which uh, deals more uh, with the future. So we see an increasing number of Israeli tech unicorns. These are companies uh, with valuation of over $1 billion. Some sources indicate that there are currently around 40 Israeli companies that fit this definition, perhaps even more. Is this phenomenon make transactions uh, with Israeli startups more attractive for Japanese corporations or perhaps the opposite? Or maybe for strategic collaborations, the higher valuation of the Israeli startup doesn't matter at all. Let's start with you, Denise. Sure. Um, so I think I would differentiate between two type of investors. There are the corporate, uh, the corporation, the corporate investors, whether they do it from their own or, or through CBC. And then there are the financial uh, investors who are more like driven by financial institutions, family offices, or high net worth individuals, right? Now, when it comes to the corporate, I think, the, they are looking for different things, right? Corporations are looking for not just financial returns is just one variable in their equation. They are looking for strategic collaboration. They're looking to access scouting to, to get more know-how. And for that, for that reason, I think valuations is not necessarily a major issue, right? And they are looking also for long-term relationships. Again, very well known that the Japanese, when they, once they invest and they are behind you, they are there for life. They are supporting you forever, right? So, so I think corp, from a corporation perspective, I don't see it as a major issue, right? From the financial investor perspective, um, I think it's a very unique time. I really think obviously that there is the valuation could be generally an issue, however, What's, what we have seen happening on the public markets in the last year and what's going to probably happen in the next six to 12 months with you know, hundreds of SPACs and IPOs, you just don't wanna miss that. You don't want to miss that board. Even if you come in late in the game now, you know, the public markets have been very, very generous to the VC investors. With, then they offered huge, huge, uh, returns. By the way, that opened up another gap, which is the early stage investing, because much less focus goes into early stage. And, and, you, and you want to build up the early stage investing in order to get to the late stage investing in five, seven years. But again, I think financial invest, for financial investors, I don't think it's a major issue, the high valuations, because you don't want to miss the, what, what's happening on the public markets. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Aki-san, how do you see the, this phenomena from uh, a Japanese perspective, corporate Japan and perhaps also Japan VC? Yeah, I think uh, from the viewpoint of the corporations, Japanese corporations, which are interested in reaching out to Israeli startups, I think it depends upon their objective. Like Dennis mentioned, if they have two objectives, uh, strategic return and the financial return as well, the higher valuation may have some negative impact for their activities. But if the corporation have the only one objective, 
which is a strategic return, which means to come up with the opportunity to work together with the Israeli startups for the new services or for new values or new technology. In that case, higher variation does not matter at all. That is what I believe. And moreover, maybe higher valuation is a kind of the proof that are uh, uh, evaluated by the uh, private market that, that they are doing good from the viewpoint of the business or technologies, which means they it, it may motivate the Japanese large corporate to have the collaboration with that startups. So it depends on the case. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dor, as an Israeli startup, is it easier for you uh, uh, when you communicate with uh, Japanese counterparties to have a higher valuation or a super high valuation? Or maybe it's an obstacle. How do you see that? Well, we're, we're not a unicorn yet, so uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. But the, comp the company is, is, does have a, what we would call a healthy valuation. And uh, I, I would chime in. Obviously, everything that was said here, I, I resonate with. I think when we look at the plus sides of a large valuation usually also means a large financial raise. And I think when you go to partner with a Japanese corporation that allows to have the type of dialogue that we would like to build with our Japanese partners and that they're expecting to have with us, which is a long-term relationship. And because of the risk taking culture in Japan, it usually takes a long time to build this relationship and you take very small steps in the beginning. So, what you're really doing is you're, you're building a five-year plan. Now, when you are a startup with $5 million in the bank, burning half a million dollars a month, you can't build a five-year plan. I mean, you, you can put it on a slide, but it's not a credible five-year plan. When you, are, when you have you know, tens of millions of dollars in the bank or hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank, you can actually build a long-term plan. And here, I think can, it can actually talk to the strengths of Japanese corporations, because I could, I could have a five-year plan discussion with a large Japanese partner. I cannot have a five-year plan discussion with a large American partner. Nobody thinks in those terms. The other side of that, of course, is that valuations can be so high that it could cause our Japanese partners to just not understand the logic and therefore see it as a higher risk endeavor. How could a two-year-old company be worth $2 billion? It does not make sense, okay? And therefore, I'm going to step out. I'm going to lean back, and I'm not going to lean in. Um, I also don't want to mention that this is not something that happened to, to Japan. The, the Japanese active investors are causing a lot of these high valuations. I mean, Masa-san at, uh, <laughs> uh, at SoftBank is a great example who, who not only participated, but maybe is um, a catalyst for a lot of the high valuations we're seeing in the market today. And I also think that when <clears throat> Japanese companies are taking bold steps, it's actually paying out. Uh, a recent example is one of our investors is uh, Sompo. And when you look at the bet they took only a year ago, of doing a joint venture with Palantir, investing well over $100 million in a super high valuation company. Um, within a year, that company IPO to NASDAQ, and they saw um, a, a very, very, very strong financial return, like very strong financial return. So what I'm trying to say is, yes, it's different, but I think large capitalization means a lot of money in the bank. And if the entrepreneurs are serious, they can actually use that towards long-term planning, which could actually allow us to, um, to partner better with Japanese companies. And also um, it can allow Japanese companies to take more risk and, uh, and see serious transformation happening at timescales that are different from what we're used to. Thank you, Dor. Uh, our time for this uh, session is up, so uh, and we want to open the discussion for uh, our Q and A. So before I pass the microphone to Lali, uh, I would like to thank uh, each one of you for the very interesting uh, discussion, and thank you for the ad audience for uh, for listening to the discussion. Back to you, Lali. Thank you very much to all of you. I think one question that was asked in the Q and A box uh, was somewhat addressed, but we can maybe highlight this in terms of what is the difference uh, of doing business with Japanese corporations versus 
uh, European and US uh, companies. And this obviously relates to the different perspectives that each of you has in the panel. Um, and again, some of it was already addressed, but feel free to just respond specifically to this, the difference in doing business with big corporations in uh, Europe, US and, and Japan. Uh, Dennis, you started saying, uh, you, you spoke about the, uh, the visibility, the future visibility. Maybe you wanna highlight this or other topics. Yeah, I think generally speaking, my humble experience working with, 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 uh, with Japanese and representing here the Israel side, um, that you have to be, uh, on the Israel side, you have to be more patient, a lot of patience. You have to have a lot of patience, right? Because the, um, the, the, I think Akisan spoke about it, the decision-making process uh, for, for Japanese investors are relatively longer uh, than, 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 than a typically you would, you, would, you, would, you would get from a Western, whether it's European or, or American investor. In, 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 in the Western world, it's, more, it's much more kind of transactional, right? When, when, when you go to Japan, they, they, it's really, they become part of your family. They see you as a family member, you know, and like almost like a marriage. And they want to make sure that they see you in every single situation. So you, it's, it's also, you have, to, you, you have to dine with them, which is amazing, an amazing opportunity. Uh, it's not a have to. It's, uh, uh, so, and, and you, you get to know them uh, well. Um, so I, so I think it's less transactional. It, it takes much longer time. That's one. The second thing that the decision making itself, it's much more on consensus basis. So even if you are, you, you are at the decision maker, everybody has to be on board. And, and therefore, you know, you need, you don't, and, and it's very, it's sometimes difficult to know who actually make, takes the final decision. So I think that's, that, that, that is, that is the key, the key uh, uh, differentiator. But what, again, once you're in, it's an, it's, 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 you are part of the family and you get amazing support that you've never seen anywhere else in, uh, before. Thank you. I'm wondering actually, Dole, from your perspective, when you look at the cap table, do you sense the difference in terms of, of interaction with the different people from different uh, geographies? Uh, yeah, again, Dennis, Dennis said it extremely well on how we build a relationship. I think once the relationship is running, um, they're, they're you know, startups are a roller coaster, right? They're amazing news and they're terrible news. And sometimes it happens on very short frequency between the two. <laughs> um, I think I've seen a change over the years on how um, Japanese um, investors deal with volatility. It used to be uh, a very difficult conversation when things change. And by the way, they don't even need to be bad news. They just need to be a change. Right? And the startups, our main competitive advantage is our agility to, um, to be able to respond quickly to changes in the market or, or challenges that we see. So I remember really thinking a lot and preparing a lot on how do I tell my Japanese partners that what I showed them three months ago is not what I'm planning to do in the future. And, and, and really, really worried about that. And I've seen a huge change over the last few years um, on actually understanding that this is, it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing that a startup is reacting and changing. Um, it's not because we were dishonest. It's not because um, um, it's risky. It's actually the reverse. It's the way to reduce risk is to respond and to change and adapt quickly. And to me, that, that used to be probably the biggest difference post, if Dennis spoke about building the relationship on post a relationship being established is how do you deal with changes? Um, and I feel that that gap has, uh, has shortened um, and, and become smaller, while the loyalty aspect that Dennis spoke about, I think, is still there. I, I think you, you do feel like you're part of the family. And, in, you know, I, in, in selling software to Japan, I would always uh, um, remark on the difference between our American customers and our Japanese customers. Our American customers were very mad that there was a problem and demanded a fix. And as soon as there was a fix, and quickly, and as soon as there was a fix, they would be happy. Our Japanese customers didn't care about, I mean, they cared about the problem, but they cared more about what was broken in my process that allowed for this problem to happen in the first place and what fundamental changes to my process I'm going to make so it doesn't happen again, as opposed to the, the bug in the software, right? And I, I think that is, Maybe as as a, as a as a software company or as a technology vendor, the single largest difference 
with Japanese customers and partners. There, you cannot um, wave your hands with magic to make a problem go away. You have to go deep. You have to be extremely honest. You have to be extremely transparent. And you have to have the right processes in place that show a continuous um, improvement um, in your company um, over time. Thanks, though. I think the next question is actually perfect for uh, Aki to address. Uh, I'll read it from the Q&A box. Uh, which sector is promising for Japanese uh, company CVC in collaboration with Israeli startups, especially after the normalization uh, of the UAE and the, I guess, the Abraham Accord? So which uh, sector are you most excited about, Aki, as you are leading a CVC? <laughs> You know, uh, when we take a look at the uh, your normalization of, uh, with the UAE people, I think the two points. The first one is uh, water-related technologies and also the agri-tech. I think, and also the one more thing is uh, new energy types of the things. So those three areas, are what I would like to take a look at. I'm sorry, just. I think it's okay. I think we're actually approaching uh, the end of this uh, of this webinar. So Gilad, if, if you wanna have any final comments. I'm sorry. Moment. No problem, no problem. I said we're just approaching the end of the webinar. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask Gilad if he has any final comments to make. And otherwise, thank you everyone for participating. And thank you the participants. Gilad, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Lali. Well, I think uh, uh, we heard a very good uh, summary of very different points uh, of view. I think, uh, like my uh, colleagues here, I, I'm also optimistic. I think that uh, the, the digitization process creates uh, even more opportunities for collaborations between Japanese companies and uh, Israeli uh, startups. I think that uh, adapting uh, to this new communication channel of uh, Zoom conversations uh, um, uh, and move this uh, forward uh, will help. I'm not sure that we could do a dinner or drinks uh, with Zoom. Maybe we should uh, we should try it out uh, in the next few weeks instead of those uh, traditional meals that we had until we could uh, travel again. But uh, I think uh, we should uh, continue to be positive. Um, and this is my message here. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, everyone, and we look forward to staying in touch. Feel free to visit us on our website and sign up. It's complimentary if you're not signed up already. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch, and the platform at ourproud.com is the best way for us to stay in touch. Thank you very much.